Good evening, a welcome. My name is Joyce Mulvaney and I'm the Communications Man Manager at Reading Municipal Light Department. I hope you're doing well and staying safe during this difficult time. Thank you for joining us for our first ever virtual homeowner info session. We held two of the four in-person sessions that were scheduled for March before the public gathering restrictions were put into place and wanted to provide a virtual session for those who didn't get the opportunity to attend. Please note that while all information included is accurate at the time of this webinar, RMLD frequently updates its programs. Please visit www.rmld.com for the most up-to-date information. My colleagues and I will touch on a variety of topics that are relevant to RMLD residential customers during today's session. All attendees are muted. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat box on the right of your screen. We'll, we'll stop periodically to review and answer questions as they come in. RMLD is a locally owned and not-for-profit electric distribution utility serving Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield Center. We're governed by a five-member board that is elected by Reading voters a citizens advisory board appointed by the four communities RMLD serves makes recommendations to the board. All meetings are open to the public. Meeting dates are posted on our website, www.rmld.com. RMLD's convenient online bill payment system is a convenient way to pay your electric bill and offers several advanced payment features such as auto pay, paperless billing, and the ability to manage multiple accounts. The system is available on our website, www.rmld.com. RMLD currently uses Twitter to communicate information on area power outages. We're in the process of rolling out a customer notification system to provide more proactive customer communication. Under this system, customers can sign up to receive alerts by phone, text, or email, depending on their preference. Unplanned outage alerts will be rolled out as the first phase of the project with additional alert types to follow an online outage map and a dedicated phone number to report outages will also be rolled out in phase one. Visit our website to opt in to receive alerts now in preparation for the upcoming launch of the system. One of our most popular residential programs is the Energy Star Appliance Rebate. These rebates are offered to encourage customers to purchase Energy Star rated appliances, which are independently certified to save energy without sacrificing features or functionality, rather than models that may cost slightly less, but are also less efficient. RMLD offers rebates on an assortment of items. You can apply online through the rebate portal located on our website or request a paper application from customer service. Another popular residential offering is our online energy efficiency store. Customers can purchase up to 24 LED light bulbs and two advanced power strips per year at 50% off the retail price. An assortment of wireless thermostats is also available with the $50 rebate instantly applied. Additional discounts on various products are also offered intermittently, providing the opportunity for even more savings. These promotions are included in our bi-monthly email newsletter and posted on our website. The no-cost home energy assessment is a great opportunity for customers to learn about their energy use and ways to save energy and money. These assessments typically consist of a trained energy advisor entering the home to evaluate its energy efficiency and then make recommendations for improvements. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, assessments are now being done virtually. By using the video feature on iPhone or Android phones, ENE advisors can capture information about the home needed to create a comprehensive report without a site visit. 
A follow-up call is scheduled to review the report and prioritize a savings plan. LED bulbs and other energy saving measures normally installed at the time of the audit are either delivered at a later time or mailed. The virtual assessment typically takes 45 to 60 minutes to complete. With increased work and schooling occurring in the home, electricity bills are expected to be higher than normal, so it's a perfect time to take advantage of this convenient program. Contact Energy New England to make an appointment. RMLD customers with natural gas service are recommended to obtain their no-cost home energy assessment through MassSave. RMLD has been running its Shred the Peak program for about four years now. The program is aimed at reducing electricity use during peak hours. Our system's collective usage during regional monthly and annual peaks is an important factor in determining future power supply costs. Peaks also impact the environment because the more inefficient and polluting power plants are called into action to meet the high demand for electricity. Shred the Peak is a voluntary customer program which encourages electricity conservation during predicted peaks. Customers who wish to participate in this program can sign up for email alerts or follow us on Twitter so they know when a peak is predicted and then take simple steps to conserve electricity during the predicted peaks. The concept behind the program is that collectively we can make an impact. One important thing to note is that peaks can be hard to predict, and so multiple alerts may be sent out each month to ensure actual peaks are captured. This is especially true in the summer months. Shred the Peak text alerts will be available as a future phase of the customer notification system that was discussed earlier in the presentation. In addition to our customer participation program, RMLD has taken some significant actions to shred the peak. Electricity that is generated within RMLD's service area helps to shred the peak by reducing the amount of electricity that needs to be purchased from the wholesale market during expensive peak times. In 2017, we installed a natural gas generator at our North Reading substation, which is run during predicted peaks. In 2019, a 10 megawatt hour battery unit was also installed at the substation. The battery is charged during off peak hours and then discharged during predicted peaks. To date, RMLD has realized a net savings of over $1 million as a result of running these systems during predicted peaks. These savings are passed directly to RMLD customers. I'll talk about the time of use rate next, and the Solar Choice program will be covered a bit later on in the presentation. RMLD has two available rates for residential customers. The standard residential rate is the same no matter what time of day electricity is used and is currently about 16 cents per kilowatt hour. Alternatively, the time of use rate has different charges for on-peak and off-peak hours. Hours considered on-peak are Monday through Friday from noon to 7 p.m., excluding holidays. All other hours are considered off-peak. Customers who sign up for the time of use rate can shift some of their electricity usage to off-peak hours by postponing tasks such as running the dishwasher and doing laundry to before noon or after 7 p.m. A customer on time of use who uses 25% of their electricity during on-peak hours would pay a blended rate of about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. During normal times, the average res residential customer uses approximately 39% of their electricity during on-peak hours. Customers who decide to switch to the time of use rate must opt in for a minimum of one year and have a special electric meter installed at their property. Customers who shift their electricity usage to 75% off peak can save approximately 18% on their electric bill. Uh, before we move along to the next presenter, uh, we're just gonna take a look and see if any questions have come through. Chuck? No new questions yet. 
OK, great. Um, I'm going to pass the presentation off to my colleague Sean Intorcio to talk about electrification. Great, thank you Joyce and thank you everyone for joining us tonight for this presentation. As Joyce said, my name is Sean Intorcio. I'm an integrated resource engineer in RMLD and I'm going to talk through the next slides about electrification and some of the programs that RMLD is offering. The number of them just newly launched this spring. But first, let's begin. What is electrification? That seems to be a very common word that we hear in the press and, and, and talked about. And what it is, is it's really kind of a coupling of two things. One is a movement to produce electricity with carbon free and renewable resources. And then coupling that with shifting um, items, appliances, different types of equipment that is traditionally fossil fueled to being powered by electricity. And it, electrification has been a tremendous increase in the transportation sector, building, building cooling and heating, water heating, and industrial manufacturing. Let's first talk about electric vehicles. I think this is one of the, the uh, technologies that I think if you look around your community, you certainly can, can start to see more and more of them. It's relatively new, but the, uh, the adoption of these measures is steadily increasing. And there's two types of electric vehicles. They could be 100% electric powered, or they can be a hybrid. And the hybrids, I think uh, very many people are, are familiar with. They've been around for a long time, uh, where we have a combination of a battery and a combustion engine backup. The plug-in EVs offer a significant advantage in terms of environmental benefits and the reduced reliance on gasoline. Owners also, over the life of these measures, save money in terms of avoided fuel costs, in terms of gasoline costs, and maintenance costs. RMLD has taken a couple steps to really promote those within our service area. Uh, one of the efforts that we have done is to offer a rebate to customers who install a level two home charging station that's network enabled. To be eligible for this, we do ask customers to go on the time of use rate, as Joyce was just discussing, and also to share their charging information with RMLD. And what those two requirements help us do is ensure that customers are charging their, their vehicles in the off-peak times, as well as giving us an understanding of the types of loads that are coming from electric vehicles and what that means to our system. We're also working with the municipalities to increase the availability of public charging stations. Uh, you'll start to see more of those, more and more of those within downtown areas and in kind of near pub public buildings. We're also looking to electrify our own fleet, the RMLD fleet, over the next couple of years. Air source heat pumps. Air source heat pumps have been a technology that's probably been around for a close to 20 years, but there's been tremendous technological in improvements within the performance of this type of heating and cooling uh, equipment, particularly when it comes to uh, performance in cold climates, such as what we have here in Massachusetts. These systems are extremely efficient. They're powered by electricity, and as I said, they do both heating and cooling uh, with the, sa the same uh, technology system. They also significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and they're a great alternative to our more traditional, you know, resistance electric space heat or oil or propane heat. So something certainly to con consider when you're in a situation where you need to replace your HVAC equipment. And the other advantage of air source heat pumps is you can use, a, use it for both cooling and heating for your entire home, have a central heat pump, or you can do it in a more modular fashion where you have what we call these mini split units where you can design it so it serves only a particular zone of your house, say if you have a new addition, or if your house is configured in such a way that you know you, you have kind of isolated parts of your home, you can use those mini split systems. So it really gives customers a lot of flexibility in how they design and how they use this, this measure. 
And another big advantage is from a heating perspective is air source heat pumps are significantly less expensive than the more traditional electric resistance heat, propane or oil. And you see that on this chart here. Now granted, they can be used for cooling. So you're going to see, if, especially if you did not have uh, air conditioning prior to that, you'll see an increase in usage in the summer. But certainly, and we are definitely a more winter focused climate here in RMLD service territory. You will notice that on this chart, natural gas is not shown here. Natural gas, even with its capacity, which is a bit constrained in, in uh, New England and in Massachusetts, it's still by far the most cost effective way uh, to heat your home. But what we have seen in our new program, which is going to be my next slide, is that some customers, even with natural gas, are choosing to put in air source heat pumps um, from the perspective of, of wanting to see the environmental benefits. So we launched RMLD's full scale air source heat pump in April. Uh, we really updated this program. You could receive a, re a rebate in our previous program, but we really revamped the program to try to promote this to customers and make them more aware of the technology. And for the most part, um, this, this table may look a little bit complicated, but this is something that contractors are in our area are very familiar with. And our, con our uh, rebates are based on the size of the unit. So in other words, if you're installing a very large um, heat pump, you're going to be receiving a larger rebate. For example, if you're putting in a two and a half ton uh, air source heat pump, um, the rebate and you're for an existing oil customer, you're going to receive a $2,500 rebate for that. The other thing that the other item that we're offering a rebate for under this program is an integrated control. We call it an add on. And we are strongly urging customers that are considering air source heat pump to talk to their contractors about this. This is a control that that hooks into both your existing system and the air source heat pump to optimize the performance of both of those systems. So in other words, it knows when which system should be operating and leads to both a more efficient operation of the unit, but also ensures that you're maintaining the, the uh, temperature that you want within your home. Another program that we launched this spring was our residential electric panel upgrade program. With the onslaught of air source heat pumps and electric vehicles and, and items like that, many customers need to upgrade their panel to um, accommodate the higher amperage. And so what we're doing is we're offering, depending on what the upgrade is, uh, different rebates for customers that are upgrading to 100 amp, that's 300 for 200 amp, 500, and then 400 amp, 750. And th these rebates apply to both standard panel updates and smart panels as well. Uh, the last program we launched this spring was our cordless electric yard equipment rebate. And I think a confluence of many homeowners being home this spring um, due to the COVID and distancing and spring cleanups and such is this has been a very popular program. And it's also the first one in Massachusetts to be offered. And again, we're focusing on, um, you know, shifting people to the cordless electric equipment and someone may ask well, why not corded well the industry with the battery development in terms of both power and longevity really is making it much more desirable to be cordless and also too a number of the manufacturers have uh, the battery set up so that you can use the same battery in multiple types of equipment and at this point i guess we'll pause for any questions before i turn the presentation over to my colleague tom alilla well sean uh we have a question from jonathan do you know if rmld and the time of use rate will be added to the eco b eco plus program that is an excellent question because that's something that we should certainly consider to kind of dovetail as we start to see more and more customers uh, look into the time of use rates as they start to implement many of these electrification measures and and, and behaviors. Uh, we'll need to do that. We don't have any firm dates or it still warrants some more investigation, but that's something that uh, that we are going to consider. 
The next question is probably for Joyce. Uh, are these slides available for viewing at a later date? Yes, we will uh, make them available. We will post them on the website uh, after the presentation wraps up and we'll also post the video so people can uh, rewatch that if they would like to. Sean, mm -hmm. does installing a sub panel count for a rebate? I think that would be something we'd have to find out a little bit more information about in terms of the characteristics of what was what was done in the sub panel. Um, so I think it might would probably be treated more as kind of a, a customized thing, but we'd have to find out more information about that. I would add to that that uh, perhaps the customer will give us a call during normal working hours and uh, can speak with you about that. We can collect the information and address the issue. Absolutely. From Angela, are rebates only for new purchases or can they be retroactively applied to recent Energy Star or battery operated yard equipment? Um, that's an excellent question. We launched this program in April, so it can go back to that date in April or thereabouts um, and that would still be eligible for a rebate. So in other words, if you purchased it in May, get your rebate application in. Another question is the time of use program posted on the website. Uh, yes, there is information about time of use posted on the website. Um, and also our customer service representatives are very, very knowledgeable. And um, if you wanted to discuss it a little bit more with them, uh, you could give them a call and speak with them about it. But yes, there is information on the website. And last question. Well, we have another one. Uh, can I get a rebate for buying used electric yard equipment? No, this just qualifies for new equipment. And the last question, where can we go to get the rebates? Uh, you go to our website, rmld.com, and there is a, a icon on there that says rebates. Click on that and go into residential, and it lists all the program, including that one, and you click on that. There's an application to fill out, and it describes what's required. The lawn equipment program is pretty straightforward. You need to fill out the application and then submit a copy of your receipt. And for the moment, that is the end of the questions that I have. Great. Well, thanks, Chuck. And I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Tom, who's going to talk about the wholesale power supply portfolio. Thank you, Sean. My name is Tom Olala, and like Sean, I'm an integrated resources engineer with RMLD. As Sean stated, electrification is not just about changing the energy consuming items we use. It's also about generating the electricity needed by these devices using carbon free energy sources. As this chart shows, RMLD's power supply portfolio has become increasingly non carbon based year over year since about 2010. And our goal is to reach 50% non carbon by 2030. We have also committed to power any new load or incremental new load resulting from electrification activities with power that is generated using these non-carbon and renewable resources. This pie chart shows a breakdown of RMLD's power supply portfolio for last year, for 2019. The RMLD grid mix referred to in this chart is similar to a mutual fund or a portfolio of mixed power supply contracts, which reflect the general mix of resources available to us from the New England grid. On average, natural gas and nuclear resources are the most abundant generation source in the New England grid, typically making up over three quarters of the total electric energy produced. In 2019, approximately 20% of New England's power supply came from hydro, wind, solar, biomass, and re, uh, refuse resources, uh, most of the, uh, the, uh, the non-carbon, so to speak, 
um, energy sources. This percentage of renewable resources is expected to increase steadily over the coming years as Massachusetts strives to achieve its carbon emissions reduction goals. The good news is that a decreasing amount of power in New England, in fact, less than 1% in 2019, came from coal and oil fire generators, uh, essentially power stations. Exceptions to this would be in the event of a major unplanned outage and or extreme peak load conditions, which may require ISO New England to activate the few remaining coal or oil peaking plants. This slide shows a more detailed look at the specific contracts that make up RMLD's power supply mix through the year 2030. The blue and white striped area at the top of this chart, which starts in the year 2023, indicates that uh, the supply that uh, indicates the supply that RMLD has yet to commit to. How we fill in these gaps provides an opportunity for us to add cost-effective non-carbon resources to our power supply portfolio. The increase in residential solar is a great example of a shift in of a shift to generating electricity with a renewable resource. The graph here shows total installed solar in RMLD's territory by town. This includes residential, commercial, and wholesale power. RMLD supports customers who wish to install solar on their homes or businesses by offering a rebate. The current residential offering is funded half by the state of Massachusetts and half by the RMLD. It is a much more lucrative than RMLD's uh, standard R renewable energy incentive. This current rebate offers our customers $1,200 per kilowatt of the solar system's nameplate rating. Since a standard size uh, residential system is about six kilowatts, this would equate to a rebate of $7,200 off the initial capital price. This is in addition to available federal and state tax credits. So if you're considering installing solar, now is certainly a great time to do it because it's already been announced. Um, many of the federal um, incentives will start to decline going forward. Solar Choice is RMLD's community shared solar program and it provides an innovative way for customers who can install solar on their own homes to still enjoy the benefits while increasing renewable energy production within RMLT's service area. Participating customers share in both the costs and the benefits associated with the community solar arrays. The energy that the arrays produce is distributed to the local community. There are currently two solar choice projects within RMLD's service area. Both are fully subscribed at the moment, but you can add your name to the waiting list on our website. RMLD is currently reviewing options for adding a third community solar project and will announce details of this as they become available. My last few slides will review our energy efficiency programs for residential customers. Did you know that heating and cooling typically accounts for as much as 40% of your to of your home's total energy use? Whether you heat using electricity or other fuel, you can save money on heating and cooling by adjusting the temperature of your home. For example, you could save as much as 10% by adjusting the temperature 7 to 10 degrees while you sleep or are away from your home. It may not be as high tech or fancy as a, a Wi-Fi enabled thermostat, but usually the biggest return on your energy efficiency dollar is sealing up or tightening up your home to stop drafts around your doors and windows and, and or increasing the amount of insulation in your home's walls and attic. 
But once you do that and have your home as tight as possible, to really heat and cool efficiency, a programmable or a, a smart thermostat can help manage the temperature in your home and keep it optimized to uh, Im improve uh, and reduce your total amount of energy used. Another key to efficient heating and cooling is cleaning and maintaining your HVAC system to manufacturer specifications and ensuring that all heating and cooling ducts are properly sealed. Both the energy efficiency rating of your appliances and how you operate them can impact how efficiently they perform. Energy Star rated appliances are independently certified to save energy without sacrificing features or functionality. RMLD offers rebates on most Energy Star rated appliances to encourage you to switch to items that are more energy efficient, saving you money in the long term. Here, this slide shows a few energy saving tips for some of the most commonly used appliances. Upgrading to energy efficiency LED light bulbs is an easy way to save electricity. LED bulbs typically use approximately 20% of the energy to produce the same amount of light as traditional incandescent bulbs did. And as an additional benefit, they typically last up to 25 times longer. RMLD offers several types of these LED light bulbs for purchase from our online store at 50% off the retail price. Before we move along to our next presenter, we'll stop here to answer any questions that came up. Chuck, do you have anything new here? We do have some questions. Uh, the first one um, is for Sean. And I know it's a question she will be excited to respond to. Can I get a cordless electric rebate for my new gas mower? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> that, believe it or not, to our audience, we did have a customer who applied and, and asked more than once why we didn't provide a rebate. But no, sorry, Chuck, they've got to be cordless and electric. <laughs> Okay. Uh, also for Sean, I had my AC redone last summer. Is it eligible for a rebate or is it too late? It It is too late. Um, it is too late, unfortunately. Um, again, we try to encourage customers to, and this is part of what this, this venue is, to make people more aware of it so that they can capture those rebates at the time that they're doing that equipment. This next one is for Tom. If I want to expand my solar installation, would I be eligible for the rebates or financial benefits? Um, I'll have to double check on that, but I'm pretty sure that yes, you would because the, the new panels that you put on or whatever you added could be looked at as an independent project and would qualify for the current, what we call our MLP solar program. But uh, uh, later on, if you want to send me that question or an email or give us a call, we'd, I'd be glad to uh, confirm that. Sean, can you recommend a service company that cleans out the dryer vents and ductwork? RMLD does not recommend specific uh, contractors for any of our programs. Uh, we do. Uh, recommend that customers uh, verify their credentials to make sure if it's safe for electrical work, which this isn't, but uh, if they're a le licensed electrician or in the case somebody like this, if it's a um, HVAC contractor, just what their credentials are. But we don't recommend specific contractors. And another question for Sean. We did the energy assessment when we moved into our home six years ago but we're unable to complete all the upgrades. Would you recommend having another assessment completed? Yes, uh, customers are eligible for an assessment every two years. And my guess is if it's been six years, there's probably been a number of changes in terms of maybe the mix of appliances and how you're using your, your, you know, your space within your home. So definitely 
uh, reach out to um, Energy New England and, and schedule your assessment. Right now they're doing virtual assessments to, to walk you through um, the home and that way it keeps people kind of safe during this, this unusual time, but you still can get one done now. Tom, as a Solar Choice One participant, someone would like us to explain how the monthly credit is adjusted. Sure, um, what we do is every six months, we look at the actual performance of the system and each project stands on its own. So the rates and the credits for Solar Choice One are typically different than uh, the Solar Choice Two program. So each one is independent. And uh, as I said, we adjust those rates every six months and then set that credit or, or um, charge for the, the next uh, six months. So starting July 1st, there's a, a new um, amount that is going in. And you'll notice that th unfortunately this time we had to decrease the uh, amount paid out because of a number of factors. The biggest driving force in that has been the historically low price of natural gas, which is the main thing that sets our fuel choice, our, our fuel charge amount. Uh, but at, on an overall basis, if you're a Solar Choice One customer, over the first 38 months of the program, those participants have achieved a net savings of $182, so approximately $200 savings over just over three years. So that programs perform very well. Solar Choice 2 has not performed quite as well, but is uh, just about at the break even point after 29 months of, of operation. Tom, another question for you. Have you seen solar farms, if yards allow, uh, V roof paneling for residents, and is there a difference? Um, the uh, solar farms are, are very large uh, ground mounted solar systems. Um, there have been a number of those installed in Massachusetts over the last few years. However, just the nature of our four towns, it's mostly suburban and there, there isn't a whole lot of open space. And it's certainly much more valuable to build houses and business on those than a solar farm. So it's not really a factor for, for our service territory. Uh, that's one I would add to uh, by having uh, the customer give us a call during normal business hours if they'd like to explain a little bit more about the specific location they're uh, considering uh, and what might be involved and what uh, approach uh, might work best for uh, optimizing a solar installation there. Um, another question for Tom. The solar cells are not provided by the electric department and on your presentation it shows that we don't have to have photovoltaic panels to get the benefit of solar. How does this work? Uh, that refers to uh, uh, joining up on our community shared solar program, the solar choice program and uh, as I discussed, we have two of those programs. Solar Choice One has about 500 participants, so it's fully subscribed. And Solar Choice Two has a just over 600. So we hope to add a third uh, program to allow new participants to join up. But uh, as of right now, we, we don't have a uh, uh, the uh, the details of the program worked out. Um, as yet, but as I mentioned, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have some news on that. Next question, a lot of us are working from home now. If I sign up for the time of use rate and find out I'm using more electricity, can I switch back to the residential rate? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, Yes, the uh, the rate is optional. Uh, the only thing we ask is if you're on our standard rate and you switch the time of use, that we ask that you stay on that for at least a year. 
and there's no cost to do the um, the switch over. Although we do have to send a technician out and physically change the meter on your home. But if for some reason, and this is very rare, you find that you're actually uh, spending more on time of use, then you could go back to the standard rate. Uh, next question, how long will the current uh, rates uh, remain in effect? Um, I'm going to take that one. We do a study every three years to look at uh, the relative cost allocations to each of our rate classes and whether the classes are paying appropriately. And we make any adjustments to the tariffs uh, at that time. Right now, we were expecting that uh, that change would be reviewed and presented to the commission uh, earlier this year. Uh, with COVID-19, we have pushed back uh, doing any modifications uh, to the rates. And we currently have that under study. So my best guess, uh, subject to uh, action by the Board of Commissioners, is that if there is a rate change, it would be uh, the beginning of next year at the earliest. And uh, we don't have enough information to be able to tell anybody uh, what the potential uh, changes, uh, either overall increase or decrease, or uh, in terms of assignments of responsibility to each of the classes. So uh, not immediately, and we're working on uh, how big a change uh, might result uh, from that. Uh, next question, are there any contractors that you do not recommend due to poor service from customer feedback? Sean, I'm going to pass that one along to you. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, we don't post, if you will, a um, a contractor list that we don't uh, refer to. However, we strongly recommend, and we ran into this with a customer just this week who had a very bad experience with a with an electrician um, to post that onto the Better Business Bureau. Um, and to report that at the state level, um, and also to make us aware of it, um, but we don't post a specific list. Again, really do the, your due diligence in terms of their certification, and personally, I've always found that word of mouth, talking with you know friends and colleagues about their experience um, is certainly really is, is kind of the best way of doing it. And again, if you're looking to um, for specific bids for work, uh, get multiple multiple bids and understand why they're different and um, you know what what's in the in there for components for the cost. Uh, Next Chuck, question. Oh, Chuck, no, one, one, one other thing I'd like to add to that is if you're looking at a, a home a residential solar system, the state website has some excellent uh, rating uh, systems, if you will, for specific contractors showing their typical rates, how much business they do, and that can be a good source to, you know, uh, vet your contractors to see if they've had good or bad experiences in other places. Uh, next question is a toss up and uh, both of uh, my engineers may have some uh, input to this. What is the best way to program the thermostat to save energy? And is there a rule of thumb? Do you want to take this, Tom, or you want me to chime uh, in? Uh, go ahead, Sean. Um, there, there is a way of doing it in terms of the both the setbacks, and this is assuming that you have um, a, a standard fossil fuel, um, either central air conditioning or heating system. It's a little bit different with air source heat pumps. Um, is that, you know, setting them back at night, uh, you know, four to six degrees has always been what we certainly have gone by. Um, 
you know, Tom, jump in with your thoughts on that. Um, and so that it's actually colder at night for the heating se system season and then flipping around for the um, the coolant. Also, too, to set it up so that during times when your home is not um, occupied that you put it on hold and with the various smart thermostats, they understand what that recovery length of time is needed to bring it back up to your desired temperature. So really be cognizant of when you're in the home and then also the setbacks at night. And again, this is for the traditional kind of fossil fuel uh, systems. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And the only thing I would add to the, what Sean said is that with the heat pump technology, just by the nature of the way those devices work, they tend to be more efficient if you do not set them back. So it's a little confusing for us and our customers that for years we've been telling you to do the, the setback at night, but we, we definitely have applications where the heat pumps are better in a set and forget. So you set it at the temperature you want and it very gradually brings the temperature up and down and, and they seem to work better that way than slamming it up real hot, hot and then going cold. But um, it's another example of where it's a good idea to work closely with your um, contractors, installers and with us when you're looking at specific systems and how best to operate them. And, that, and that's one reason we added the incentive for the integrated controls um, on the heat pumps because that's the point where where we would work with you to make sure you're uh, getting the, the best value out of your system. The only thing that I would add to that is that you consider a vacation mode setting uh, if you're going to be away from the house for an extended period so that you don't uh, over control it into a comfort zone that nobody's there to appreciate. Um, so I just offer that up. Um, last question that I have uh, for Tom, do I understand the time of use program correctly that if I use power during peak periods, I get charged the higher rate, but if I use power off peak, I take advantage of the lower rate, hence the metaled rate you mentioned earlier? Yes, that's exactly the point of the program is that there's an economic incentive to um, shift the uh, the time that you use the appliance, especially the appliances that tend to use the most in the home, like uh, a washer dryer or a dishwasher or things you can fairly easily change to do that, um, to operate those appliances uh, when you can during the uh, off peak hours. And Tom? If a current customer in the Solar Choice program sells the house and moves, will the new homeowner take that spot or does the next person on the wait list become eligible to participate? Uh, that's an excellent question. It doesn't come up very often, but there's been a few cases and the policy right now is that we would go by the wait list. It's, uh, it's not really the new homeowner the new homeowner doesn't really have priority over that. And um, one main reason for that is it's possible a customer could sell their home and move to another home in, still in our service uh, territory. So his solar choice could go with him. Thank you. And that's the questions for the moment. OK, with that, I will turn it over to my uh, coworker, Mike Carroll, who's going to talk. Uh, Mike's from our tech services group. He's going to provide you with an overview of your home electrical service, how it's configured and some safety tips. So take it away, Mike. OK, thanks, everybody. Um, so my name is Tom's mentioned is Mike Carroll. I'm a senior technician with uh, RMLD. So the first slide we're going to get up here to show you is a uh, typical overhead electrical installation. The boundary line, it's also known as the point of demarcation, is where RMLD ownership ends and homeowner ownership begins. So that point is where RMLD connects our service wires to the homeowner's wires. 
So if your um, electric service is underground, that's, uh, I'll, I'll touch on that. If anybody has any questions a little bit later, I could briefly tell you that in that situation, you pretty much own the wires that go from the street to your house uh, that are all underground. But overhead, we own the wires to your house. And where we connect to your wires is uh, we, where you take over and we own. The only thing that we own after the point of demarcation is the electric meter. Uh, not to be confused with the meter box. We come out to your house, we'll install the meter, and we'll run our service line from the pole to the house. On the um, slide here that you can see is color coded. Uh, everything that you see in red is what red and light owns. Uh, the electric meter the service line and the service connection, as I just said. All the other items pictured with the blue arrows are owned by the homeowner. This includes the weather head, the dead end eye screw, the service entrance cable, the meter box, and the grounding equipment. On our website, www.rmld.com, there is a video uh, from an, one of our electricians, uh, Rich Pugliafico, and myself that describes a little bit more in detail on the homeowner's responsibility of what we own and what you own. The second slide here, uh, what is normally found on the inside of your home is your electric panel. That's usually you could be found in your basement or your garage. As you can see, there are no red arrows in this picture uh, because red and light does not own any of this equipment. The blue arrows are showing you the electric panel, the whole house surge protector, and grounding rods, which are all owned by the homeowner. The green arrow shows the water meter that is owned by the water department. Uh, one device in this slide that we want to cover in some detail is the whole home surge protector. A surge protector is used to protect electronic devices against power surges. A surge protector works by redirecting the excess power to ground. Uh, just to be clear, a whole home surge protector does not block all power surges from entering the home. Power surges don't come just from lightning. The average home experiences about 20 power surges per day. Surges can come from lightning, major appliances cycling on and off like your dishwasher, dryer, HVAC system, or hot tub. Electronic equipment that is not protected can be damaged by these surges. Uh, repairs can be quite costly for TVs, laptops, washers and dryers, etc. RMLD recommends a layered approach to surge protection. This is a recommendation, not a requirement. By layering, we mean a whole home surge protector would be the first part of your defense against power surges used in accompanying with the surge protection power strips that most of us are familiar with. The home, the whole home surge protector is best to be installed by a licensed electrician. Uh, just an FYI on that, there is a possibility that your electric panel is full and does not have room for expansion. Therefore, a whole house surge protector might require you to upgrade your panel to uh, allow the the uh, capacity to add that circuit to your panel. Uh, on power strips, every strip is different. Um, the the trick style ones that have uh, some great features with them include different receptacle capabilities. You have a few always on, a control, and several switched outlets. You have your TV plugged in as the control, and then you have your DVD player, soundbar, video game, etc., plugged into the switch outlets so that when you turn off your TV, off the strip will also turn off the power to the other devices. Surge protection is only as good as the grounding system it is connected to. The grounding system in your home is a backup path that provides an alternate route for electric current to flow back to ground in the event of a problem. Without a properly grounding system, property damage and personal injury could occur. The grounding system must be continuous. 
Our slide here shows ground and rods um, that will bring the fall to ground. Those ground and rods are usually installed outside. Uh, they installed two of them about six feet apart. Sometimes on a new house, they'll put them one in the foundation. Some of these new houses have plastic water lines coming in from the street, so you, you don't have a good ground. And uh, the electrician is going to create a ground for you by installing these ground rods. Um, on the um, slide here, you see a, a water filtration system. Uh, so that has a plastic housing and that is interrupted your ground. So that's why we have a ground going to the other side, which is going to all your faucets and uh, protecting everything that's inside your house. Um, so we, we jump it across that whole house water filtration system. It is recommended that a home electrical system be checked about every five years by an, a licensed electrician. The electrician can tighten and clean your electrical connections as well as making sure that the ground system is set up properly and is continuous. It's a good idea also to exercise your breakers. A lot of times these um, where you're grounded to down here in your basement, it gets corroded and you, you're losing a good ground and God forbid something ever happens, you're going to need that direct that electricity to ground. And if you don't have a good ground there, it's it's going to um, it's going to do some damage to um, the equipment in your house. Uh, if you're going to do some work on your house, you can call Red and Light, and we'll send the lineman out there to put some insulation up over your service wires. This is typically done if you're going to paint your house, have your house sided, have some roof repair. Uh, you're going to have a guy up there near the electric service, near your wires. It's dangerous, so we'll come out there free of charge and we can rubber up that whole service. And um, and when you're done, you just call red and light and we'll come back out to your house. We'll take down the rubber and, um, you know, once everything gets reattached to your house, your new roof's up, you're painted, you're sided, and everybody uh, will be happy and safe. Uh, this next slide shows some storm damage that occurred with a tree falling on the wires. Uh, this is this is a situation where possibly it's going to send a surge into your house because of Mother Nature. So uh, that's why checking the grounds in your house is very important. Um, you know, don't touch these wires. Obviously, if you see a lower down wire or a tree making contact with the electric wires, please call RMLD. A lineman will come out. They've obviously been trained and have the arc flash rated clothing as well as all the equipment and gear to handle any situation. We'll kill the power and uh, get everything up and running. And if you need an electrician to fix some of the damage done on your house, we'll uh, give you a heads up to get an electrician out here as soon as possible. And once he uh, gets everything back up on your end, we'll reconnect you. Um, that's pretty much it, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Um, right now I have two questions. Uh, the first is for Tom. Um, are the off-peak and peak hours in the time of use, do the off-peak and peak hours in the time of use change or is there a standard once you are on the time of use rate? Uh, the answer to that is the um, solar choice uh, analysis that we do every six months to look at what the credits or charges are is just is strictly dependent on the performance of the solar array system itself. It, it really is independent of what the participants load is. So it doesn't matter what your rate is, how much power you're using at your home um, or what what time you use that power. It's really an independent um, calculation that's based strictly on the output of those uh, uh, of the large array system. And also for Tom, 
do you know how many people are currently on the wait list for the Solar Choice program? Um, I haven't looked at that in a while, but um, I, it's typically in the 50 to 100 people range. <clears throat> I think uh, we can add to that that we are exploring uh, the options for expanding the uh, amount of uh, solar production capacity that would be available through uh, a third phase of the Solar Choice program. Uh, we're uh, currently uh, soliciting uh, some uh, information from potential uh, participants uh, with us in the program uh, for uh, what opportunities are present and how uh, the structure of such a program would work. Um, we were planning on uh, moving along the request uh, for proposals this spring. Uh, that's been pushed back a little bit, but I think uh, we're uh, looking at uh, activating that over the course of this summer. So uh, check back with us, but uh, we should uh, have a better understanding of what we can do to uh, shorten the existing list and uh, create additional opportunities uh, here uh, later this year. Um, the, the question uh, that Tom answered just a moment ago was, is off-peak and peak hours in TOU, would they change or is there a standard once you are on the time of use rate? So I think they're referring to the to the noon to seven hours. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that, Tom. Yeah, um, sorry, I, I mis misread that, I guess. Um, yeah, those hours have been fixed for, I think, since the start of the program. So um, those are typical across different utilities and, and we don't have any current plans at adjusting those, the, the, uh, the time periods anyway. I guess one additional uh, point to make is that those hours are set based on how our regional uh, generation pool, ISO New England, uh, operates. And those are the, the period of high or peak usage. Uh, our uh, Shave the Peak program uh, operates uh, within that time window and our time of use rates, industrial and residential, operate uh, within that window. So we would expect that to be uh, very stable going forward unless there's a shift in the way the wholesale market behaves. So right now, those are the hours and those are likely to be the hours. Okay, it does not look like there are any other questions coming through. Um, we put the our email address up on the screen for you. Um, there were a lot of questions that came in tonight, and if we did not effectively um, answer any of them or you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and even though our lobby is still closed as a result of coronavirus, we are available. Our customer service staff is available to answer the phones and um, can get uh, questions to us as well, so feel free to give us a call. Um, thank you for uh, being patient with us through our first ever webinar. It's definitely a, a different experience for us. Um, hopefully we'll be able to see you in person sometime again soon, but um, thank you. Be safe, take care, and we will post uh, the webinar and slides to the website over the next day or two. Thank you.